I want to thank Rick for his work in pulling this together. Uh, I'm actually going to start with remembering what we've just heard and trying to put that in the perspective of the fact that more people died in the firebombing of Tokyo than died in Hiroshima. I want us to think back to the tens of millions of people who died in World War II or the Brno atomic bombs. I want us to think about the nation of Iraq, which we have destroyed without any atomic bombs, the tragedy of Afghanistan with no atomic bombs, and the fact that three million Vietnamese were killed by the Americans with no atomic bombs. The issue is not, I'm sorry, nuclear weapons. The issue is war. And if August 6th and 9th made any sense to us at all, it was a statement to us that we had to confront the issue of war itself, not a specific weapons system. Now, having said that, I want to give the background to what I think caused the creation of the Golden Rule. If you go back to 1947, when the Cold War started, uh, and realized there were nuclear tests going on in 1956, the country had really been silenced politically. The left had been hounded during the Cold War and the McCarthy period. Uh, anyone on the left, anyone who was liberal, was really pretty frightened by McCarthy. Some of you were old enough to remember that. And the country was pretty well quiet politically, afraid to talk about foreign policy, afraid to ask whether we really had to have nuclear tests. And it was in 19... Uh, 55, that something happened had nothing to do with the peace movement, but it liberated us. And as Bayard Rustin reminded me once, when Mon Mon Montgomery happened, Montgomery, Alabama, when the black community rose up in opposition to segregation, that was like a hammer blow on a piece of steel, and all of the steel all over the country vibrated. And we had the feeling that if the black people could do this, maybe we could do something. And it was, therefore, I think the beginning of this comes from Montgomery, Alabama, Martin Luther King, and the black church. If you go then to 1957, there was a meeting in Philadelphia called by Larry Scott and A.J. Musty, and I think George Willoughby was there, his daughter, may know whether George was at that meeting, to discuss what in the world they could do about the fact the country was paralyzed and unable to do anything about nuclear tests or the arms race. And they decided on two different tactics. One was simply to get a number of prominent people, and this was headed by Norman Cousins, to get a number of prominent Americans to sign an ad in the New York Times calling for a sane nuclear policy. Wasn't a demonstration, wasn't an action, it was entirely legal, and that was <clears throat> one half of the prong that came out of the meeting in Philadelphia. Uh, and as you know, out of that ad, there were thousands of responses. People suddenly felt they could get involved, and what we learned, what we call sane, was organized and later became eventually peace action, which had Greetings sent to you today. The other prong was the effort to think about how nonviolence could be used directly, and that was the Committee for Nonviolent Action that was organized, a sort of loose grouping. And the project they came upon as they thought about what they could do that would apply the principles of Gandhi to this impossible arms race we were trapped in was to sail a boat into the Pacific, into the test area. I knew two of those on the boat. Jim, Jim Peck was on the staff of the War Resisters League, uh, and I knew him very well. And George Willoughby I knew very well. He was in Philadelphia, very active in the peace movement. And the two of them, and, and others you, whose names you know, uh, managed to get the idea, the crazy, insane idea, of sailing this little boat across the Pacific 
into the test pen area. Now, as it turned out, as you know, they got arrested and went to jail for 60 days in Hawaii. And as you know, in the nature of how things happen, they spurred the Phoenix to sail into the test pen area. So while the voyage of the Golden Rule failed to get into the test pen area, it managed to get someone else in. I just want to say a couple of more things. One of the, how many here are vets? Are there anyone left in the audience? Okay. <clears throat> I want to say, as a, as a staff of the War Resisters League for many years, uh, you're all familiar with the idea that the peace movement spit on the vets when they came back. And that is a categorical lie. The peace movement stood with the Vietnam vets all the way through. Uh, through the war, we helped them get to Canada during the war. When they came back from Vietnam, we helped them with the bad papers and discharges and all the help we could give them. And so the idea that the peace movement in any way turned on the vets is a lie. Uh, and I'm delighted that the, the, our vets involved to help turn this country around. I do get irritated when I hear the commercials on television for the wounded vets of America. If we want to deal with wounded vets, don't send people to Iraq and Afghanistan. Bring them home. But having said that, I think that today has been a magnificent day, an example of what a handful of people have been able to achieve in getting the golden rule going. Uh, and back on track, which no one really thought was possible. I just do want to say again, the issue is really not nuclear weapons, it is war. We have managed to kill, to remind you in World War II, the, the Soviet lost 27 million people. 27 million people. The Germans lost tens of millions of people. There were 12 million killed in the extermination camps, all without any nuclear weapons. The enemy is not just nuclear weapons, it is the institution of war. And if August 6th and 9th taught us anything, it was a warning within history that this institution has to be put to sleep as well as the weapons that we have developed. Thank you.